episode of the Milk and Bourbon podcast. I am still working on the Donner Party podcast. It requires working through quite a bit of firsthand accounts from who was, well, a four-year-old at the time of the occurrence. Very interesting story, but it takes quite a bit of combing through some verbiage that's really difficult to read because it was written uh, in the 1800s. So working through that. But in the meantime, I wanted to, to shoot a podcast Uh, talking about something that I'm really passionate about, and that's my family history. Three or four years ago, during a family reunion, I I chose to look through records that were on Name Your Website uh, to get kind of an understanding of where my family came from. And what started off as a couple generations back quickly evolved into, uh, I think it ended up being 36 generations back on my father's mother's side. So my grandmother's side went up until about the 800s and it was a really exciting find and I wanted to share it with my family. And it it led to kings and it led led to Norman conquerors. So William the Conqueror ended up being one of my, my forebears. And at initial blush, that's very interesting. It is still very interesting, but I thought it was incredibly unique as well. After doing a little bit of research, much like Charlemagne, Charlemagne can be traced by 22% of people of European descent as their forebear. About 10% of Europeans can trace their lineage back to William the Conqueror if they go back far enough. And it's because of people like his son, Henry Beauclerc, who was also king of England, who had, I think it was 19 partners at one point. And, uh, it was common practice back then. Kings wanted to make sure that they could pass down their their royal lineage, so and children didn't really have the survival rate that they have today. And so they would do they would make up for that by having as many kids as possible with as many women as possible. So we're the result of one of those extraneous women in in King Henry's life, and that's okay. It was still very exciting. We got to see when we came over from England and the hardships that some of our family members had to endure in order to get us to where we were at. Uh, There was a Daniel Morgan, I want to say in the 1700s, maybe late 1600s, who floated a a river down on a a raft that he had fashioned out of logs that he had cut himself, and they lived in a cave for about six months before they could build their house. Just things like that. It's very interesting history. Uh, Was finally able to locate our the elusive Native American gene that my family always used to espouse. Because if you didn't know, a lot of people from rural rural areas in the Kentucky, Virginia, Tennessee area would claim to be Native American because the Native Americans had a higher literacy rate uh, for the most part than anyone in in white families that had moved into the, the West, which was at the time what was the West. So very interesting moment for me to be able to show that to my family. And it was a really special moment because not many people knew about that kind of stuff. And in so doing, I had uh, excited my, my father about it. He, he got excited about it as well. He didn't know much beyond his, his grandfather's name, maybe great grandfather's name. And before that, it had been lost to the annals of history. And so I started to do research on that. But before I get to that point, there's something that's seemingly unrelated, but also very interesting. While I was doing this, I was doing a research paper for my maneuver captain's career course. And you were to choose a battle, analyze the battle, and try to attribute some of the things they did to uh, tactics that are used today in today's army. So I I chose something from way, way back in the 11th century in the island of Sicily in the middle of the Mediterranean, where it's called the Battle of Sarami, where a group of 130 heavy cavalry Norman knights faced off against somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 mounted Saracens, along with supplements from the Zirid Empire in Africa. And it was all over control of the island. There had been Arabic control of that island for, I think, two centuries and they wanted to maintain that because it was a chief grain producer for Africa and, and the empires that were ruling in Northern Africa at the time. And then the Normans who had been pushed out of Normandy because of the size of it and the feudal system that required you to have land in order to have wealth, moved to other areas to try to establish their own claims to, to land. 
And uh, in doing that research, I, I in that Battle of Sarami, having these 130 knights going up against uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of Saracens it was really interesting. And the tactics were cool because they used tactics from defeats they had suffered in the past in, in Italy against the Byzantines and Seljuk Turks to hone their craft and become great in their own right in their conquering of Sicily. And I've done that paper and I was really interested in these men that were leading them, Robert Giscard and Roger de Hotville, who were the two main commanders of, of these units that were operating in Sicily. And brave men, incredibly intelligent men, tough son of a guns. And uh, in doing that, I was able to also get a little bit of a, a cool connection to history. So I, I started the research of, of my father's family, family line along the same time. And I reached back enough through death records and births and marriage records and, you know, draft cards and all of this stuff. And I started started making these connections using the National Archives. And I got back to John the Martyr, which very cool story there. Um, he was a Protestant preacher in England. He is partially responsible for the, the fullest translation of the Holy Bible into English, or at least the first full translation. And he is known to be the first martyr of Bloody Mary's reign. Uh, she had just taken power. She wanted to eliminate the Protestant faith as the, the official religion of England and wanted to return to Catholicism. And by doing that, she had heard of a, of a sermon provided by John the Martyr, John Rogers the Martyr. And he had basically said that everyone should be able to practice their own religion based off of their own beliefs. She didn't like that. She told him that if he didn't retract those statements that she was going to kill him. And she followed up on that about 11 months later, burning him at the stake, which was pretty insane to me. Uh, you, you don't really truly understand the barbarism that people are capable of until you, until you read about it or see it or in, in the world that we live in, it's just crazy to think about. Now, having successfully reached John the Martyr, it got much easier after that because the contemporary historians of John the Martyr wanted to establish his parentage because he became so notorious for sacrificing for what he believed in. People were wanting to find out more about his history. And so by doing that, we got back until about the 10 hundreds and somewhere around the, the 11 hundreds. Let me step back a second. The 11 hundreds, the last name Rogers was actually Fitz Roger. And that's because at the time, Fathers would name their sons X first name, and then their last name would be Fitz plus the father's first name. So Fitz Roger would mean son of Roger. They do that still today in some Scandinavian countries. And through Fitz Roger, we were able, we were able to connect that last name to who Roger was originally, and that was Roger de Hotville. Kind of bringing it full circle, I had unintentionally done a paper on a battle led by someone that was my immediate father on down the line about 33 generations. And it's just cool and almost mystical that of all the, the battles I could have chosen and all the civilizations I could have chosen, it was that one. And it was the one that I was connected to most. And now I'm going to wrap this up. The Normans were a conquering peoples and for a long time they were mercenaries, but they, because they were so powerful and so numerous in these other countries, they received recognition from the Pope, um, rival, rival nations. And over time they had conquered England, most of England, Northern France, Southern Italy, Sicily, Northern Africa, and if they had maintained those holdings today, they would be fourth in GDP in the globe. But to end that, I'm going to sign off the way I always do. It's with a nice toast created by my forebears, talking about my forebears, drinking something that forebears made. It's just a really cool full circle moment. 
up to it, down to it. Till next time.